You're listening to Driving Law, a podcast by Kyla Lee about all things related to the rules of the road. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Driving Law. I am Kyla Lee at Acumen Law, and with me... My guest today is Maryam Maj Zadeh, and she is an articled student. She started her articles at our office uh, with Roy Ho, but uh, as I think some of our podcast listeners know, Roy is now a member of the Civil Resolution Tribunal, and so couldn't remain her principal. So she's got a new principal, but uh, she is still very connected to our office, and we like her a lot. Maryam, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. (laughs) I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm glad to have you because I thought, you know, when I saw this case, I thought it, well, it frustrated me, but I thought maybe I need like an opinion from somebody who, I think you are much more compassionate in your way of looking at things than me. (laughs) Um, So I thought uh, you would be the perfect person to talk about this case with. Um, So I sent you before uh, a copy of the Taylor decision. This is a a traffic ticket case out of Abbotsford. And um, as you know, uh, but for our listeners, what happened was uh, Mr. Taylor was issued a ticket uh, in July of 2019. He disputed it a week later, August 6, 2019, filed his dispute. He hired a lawyer like a week after that. So he was, uh, or sorry, a year after that. I'm lying. He hired a lawyer a year after that, but he didn't have a court date yet. He didn't get offered a court date until January 21st, 2021. So like eight, eight, 18 months, roughly, a little under 18 months after the ticket happened. His hearing date was March 2021, at which point he filed a charter notice saying, hey, my rights under Section 11B of the Charter have been violated because my hearing took more than 18 months to take place. And uh, so he said, essentially, that, uh, that the ticket should be thrown out. And the court looked at the circumstances that had transpired in the case and essentially said, no, we can sub- subtract a bunch of the delay to put it under this presumptive 18 month ceiling because COVID and the courts were shut down from March 18th to mid July, Um, which you were like, had you just started your articles then or had you not started yet? Not yet. I started, um, yeah, later in the summer. So you avoided the like most boring part of articles where there was no court and nothing to do. Yeah. Yeah. What were people doing at that time actually? I mean, we still had IRPs, so they were working on IRP stuff and doing research, but it was like a lot of not doing very much. (laughs) And nobody was in the office either. So like, it wasn't like you could pick up a file and, you know, interview the client or something. It was like, nothing was happening. Oh my God. Yeah. I missed all that. (laughs) So anyway, they subtracted this delay and they get it down to um, 15 months and 24 days, which uh, the the court um, uh, says, if this was institutional delay of 15 months and 24 days, I would have no hesitation in concluding that this case had taken markedly longer than it should have. I would have been directing a stay of proceedings. And the court, the court looked at a bunch of cases and, and found that, you know, even in, in delays under 18 months, it's ridiculous because of how simple a traffic ticket is that it should take that long. I don't know about that, but mm-hmm. I don't think they're that simple. <laughs> it's, my, it's our livelihood. Um, and ultimately, the court said, though, that Mr. Taylor had failed to prove his uh, rights were violated on a balance of probabilities. And the reason the court said this, and the part that gets me, but I'm going to ask your opinion on it first, um, see if you can change my mind, because I'm I'm harsh. Um, The reason the court said that the delay was um, not a problem was that even after traffic court reopened, there was further COVID related delay because all of the hearings that had been rescheduled had to take priority over Mr. Taylor's date 
And the court couldn't identify how much of this additional four months um, could have been caused by these other cases. So therefore, all of it must have been exceptional circumstances delay and subtracted and the, that was under a year and that was totally reasonable. So what, what do you think about that, Mario? I mean, I, in no way do I think uh, that the four months is, is reasonable. Like I understand it was a global pandemic and everything, but I, I still think that the courts um, should have accommodated this somehow. Um, I just, I, I don't think that this, this was quite reasonable. Um, I know that you're kind of look, you, you know, you, you thought that I'd have a compassionate view. I don't know if you meant for the individual or for the, the court system, the justice system, but I don't think I have that quite yet. I don't see their, the justice system's angle. Um, I, I do think that it's a little bit long, um, Mr. Taylor's weights and everything, but, but what's your opinion on this? Well, I was, I was actually really frustrated um, to see the way that the court put a burden on Mr. Taylor that he didn't have in a charter application. And not just that, but also to explain something that he couldn't explain. Like, how does he know how many cases, first of all, he'd have to be able to say how many cases had been adjourned in that, in that shutdown period. Of those, how many had to be rescheduled in the sense that they weren't you know, stayed for other reasons or paid in the meantime or whatever, how many had to be rescheduled? And then how long that rescheduling process took place? Like that's not information he has access to. It's not public data that you can just download um, like a completed court list. It, they don't publish the traffic court lists online. And so it's, it's, it's like literally impossible for him to be able to say that. And for the court to say, well, I can't calculate the true delay because Mr. Taylor didn't bring this evidence that is beyond his ability to provide. And I'm going to infer that it's possible that up to another four months, which appears to be totally arbitrary, could be explained by this. They're essentially increasing as well the burden of proof on the charter application from balance of probabilities to beyond a reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. No, I, I completely agree with you. Um, I kind of saw it the same view as well. I guess I don't know if you have an opinion of why you think the courts like they haven't, they they don't produce like they don't give out the this information if it's because it's um, too burdensome or if it's um, private information. Well, it's, it's not private. I mean, court is a public place and you can, I mean, you could go on CSO and you could search the names of every single person you know to see if they have a traffic ticket. Like um, if you're ever a witness in a criminal case, I'm looking up your your, your ticket disputes on, on CSO online so I can cross-examine you on what a bad driver you are. Um, you know, it, it is public information. It's it's court information and it is a matter of public record. In theory, you could get it through freedom of information, although you wouldn't get the names of the people, you would still get the court file number and, and the dates and all of that relevant information. But then that would add an inordinate amount of de delay because you'd have to file the FOI request, then wait for the response to the FOI request, and you know they never provide them in 30 days. And then, you know, his whole point of this is taking too long would be frustrated by having to wait to get the evidence that he needs to prove that it took too long. I also think, and this is the other thing that frustrated me about this, is the court just like arbitrarily picks that another four months could be added because there were four, you know, there were, there were no hearings from March to July, which was roughly four months. Yeah, mm -hmm. count. I had to count on my fingers there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, and doesn't factor in that things changed after COVID, right? Instead uh -huh. of traffic court, it used to be at, at nine and one, or nine and one, nine thirty and one thirty, 30, uh, except at Robson Square, where it was at 9 30, 10 45, 1 30, and 2 45. Um, it, it used to be that you had only two sessions a day, and now there's a session every half hour. Mm -hmm. So the court can take on more disputants. They also added night court in various locations in the province. And again, you know, some of these tickets were probably paid or stayed in the meantime for various reasons. 
um, thereby reducing the, the burden on the court altogether. So I think that information being decided in a vacuum by the judge to me is problematic. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. I think that in fact, since you bring this issue up, I think that during those four months, like it should have been, this information should have been disclosed just because Mr. Taylor's situation isn't probably the only one, um, the only individual who's encountered this extensive delay. So if this information was available, at least people would feel more justified or they would really be able to see that it's been delayed because of, you know, other individuals who um, are waiting for their court date, right? So um, the court should have foreseen kind of um, once they open up after COVID that this could, this could be an issue, you know, being closed for four months and having all these scheduled uh, hearings. Now, if a person were bringing an application like this in the future and trying to make an argument like this, um, one thing that I thought that they could do that would maybe put them in a better position as far as like being able to say, I have the evidence, mm -hmm. is subpoena somebody from the violation ticket center to come and, and testify about this. Like uh, to testify that this is valid, that they're, this information, but, yeah. Yeah, well, about the changes that were made, about the, about the fact that um, things were rescheduled on a much better priority basis, all of that. I think, you know, if you subpoenaed somebody from the violation ticket center and you made it known to them what information you wanted, they'd probably cough it up right away uh, to avoid having to be cross-examined on it. Of course. But see, I, I guess I just find it a bit heartbreaking if this is our justice system when, you know, this global pandemic has happened and shouldn't they be considering all these hearing dates that were scheduled and now have to be rescheduled, people having to wait and be mm -hmm. delayed. So shouldn't they try to provide this information up front at least? Oh, yeah, totally. That's like such a good point. Um, and the other thing that frustrated me about this this judgment just has me very frustrated um, the other thing was it was kind of like the court said well Mr. Taylor's rights have to be weighed against the rights of all the other people whose hearing dates were adjourned and all those other people who waited you know probably longer or just as long to get their their court dates were more entitled to a a fast trial date than he was and that's not, you know, that's not how your, your charter rights don't exist in comparison to other people. Like we don't walk around and go, you know, well, this search and seizure where the police busted into your house without a warrant and, and took your dog um, is not as bad as the search and seizure where the police busted into the home without a warrant and killed somebody. So therefore it's not a violation. Right, like that might go to remedy, although on, on delay, the only remedy is a stay. But it would never go to whether or not there was a violation that somebody else may have also had their rights violated, but for this person having their rights violated. The court's not looking at what would have happened to other people. The court's supposed to be looking at what happened to Mr. Taylor and and was it was it just? Mm -hmm. I think personally, I think the court courts just didn't want to deal with that because again, I don't think Mr. Taylor was the only one in this situation. Um, so it's easier to just blame it on this global pandemic and say, well, there are other people who haven't had their um, court. So they take priority um, and not considering each and every individual's rights. Oh, you know, it's been 15 months for you. It's been 16 months for you, right? Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's how you're supposed to look at a charter application, look at the person and their circumstances, not, you know, not find the easy way out by saying, well, other people had it just as bad and, and their rights are more important than yours today, Mr. Taylor. I, I don't know. I just, I'm, I'm disappointed in this judgment. If, if Mr. Taylor is listening, I will appeal this. If you want to appeal, I would take this case uh, pro bono. <laughs> <laughs> Miriam will assist me with it. <laughs> Just volunteer to go. <laughs> yeah, I definitely think it could have been argued better. Or at least some of the elements that you mentioned could have been brought up. I, I don't feel like it was touched on. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's shift gears and talk about something more fun. Um, I thought that I would let you in on my favorite part of the podcast, which is 
the Ridiculous Driver of the Week. The Ridiculous Driver of the Week. You're going to love this guy because you're going to be like, I know, I know this kid. I know this person. I went to high school with this kid. Also, this kid calls our office all the time. So this is one of my favorite officers in the Vancouver Police Department. Um, Sergeant Christensen recently posted a picture of his uh, laser gun showing a speed reading of 106 kilometers per hour in a 50 zone. 56 kilometers over the speed limit. Um, the driver uh, who was stopped had an N, so was not a fully licensed driver. Wow. Mm -hmm. And when asked why he was going that fast, he said, well, the speed limit's too low and uh, it should be 70, which doesn't really make much of a difference if you're going 106 you're yeah. 36 over the speed limit um and then told sergeant christensen that he failed his driving test twice for going too fast oh <laughs> <laughs> wow that's something to tell an officer <laughs> oh, this is a lesson in why you remain silent when you're pulled over yes. by <laughs> But you know this kid, right? Like you went to high school with this this kid, right? They're all they're out there. Yep, <laughs> we all we've all met those in our lives. Yeah. The speed limit is too low. I should be going thirty six over the the speed limit. I think it should be <laughs> one hundred and six. Jesus, I don't even know. I don't think I go. I rarely go like above the speed limit, even on the highway, right? Like the highway is ninety kilometers an hour, and I go ten above, right? Not even one hundred and six. Really? You don't, you don't go 20 over? I'm a, tw I'm a, I'm like a solid, like 15 to 20 over on the highway. In the fast lane, you know, the, the left fast lane. Yep. If I go in the slow, like the regular lanes, people, <laughs> whatever people are going in front of me, I just follow them really. <laughs> I, uh, I figure on the highway, I'm not going to get pulled over for anything less than 30 over. Um, cause what's the point? Everybody's going 20 over people are passing me at 20 over so I'm not I'm not going to be the target and then on the you know the regular Vancouver streets I'm 10 to 15 over wow so see since I have I started working at uh, our office I I feel even more paranoid since I know how things happen now you know I know <laughs> it is true I would be like humiliated to get a ticket because First of all, I would probably know the officer giving me the ticket and that would be embarrassing. Um, and I'd have to see them in court. And then like, how do I negotiate with a straight face when I got the same ticket? Um, and the other thing that would embarrass me would be just worrying that I would end up in Sergeant Christensen's Twitter, a photo of me sitting in my car looking sheepish. Oh, <laughs> that's too funny. He would, take, he would great, take great delight in putting me on Twitter if he caught me doing anything. So <laughs> <laughs> that's too funny. Oh, so, so you've never had any tickets? I have had, let's see, I got a ticket. Uh, I lost my license when I had my N. I had two speeding tickets. Oh, wow. I got a driving prohibition. But here's a story for you I got a driving prohibition because I had two speeding tickets and the um, second speeding ticket I got, I knew it would trigger a driving prohibition, so I filed it in dispute. But my dispute didn't get registered by ICBC, so they sent me a driving prohibition in the mail, which I acknowledged and served. And then they sent me a letter at the end of the driving prohibition going, oh, we discovered that your ticket was actually disputed and we're so sorry. Um, your driving prohibition is cancelled. They made me pay oh, wow. for a new license, even though they they had wrongly suspended it and I wrote all this down and I had all the records of it and my big plan was I was going to go into court and I was going to challenge my speeding ticket on the basis that my charter rights had been violated because my presumption of innocence had been um had been uh, violated by the imposition of the driving prohibition assuming that I'd been convicted wow what a plan and what happened <laughs> 
uh, the officer pled no evidence. And I was so sad. I was like, this is the worst. I remember going home and like talking to my grandpa and I was like, this is the worst. I wanted to argue my case. I was all ready. Um, of course it was traffic court and I never would have been able to make a charter argument. Also the driving prohibition had nothing to do with my presumption of innocence being violated. It was like collateral consequence. So it probably wouldn't have warranted an you know, extreme remedy of a stay of proceedings, but I was 17. Oh, was wow. Yeah. Oh wow, you you wanted to do all this when you were 17? Yeah. Oh wow. So you're passionate about the law like from way back. Oh yeah. I always wanted to be a lawyer. I didn't know that. Yeah. It oh, was my cool. first it was my first big case that I won, but not the way I wanted. <laughs> At 17. Wow. Wow. Super cool. Oh. Yeah. And then I didn't get any tickets after that until I went to Kansas. Wait, Kansas? What well, when was this? Uh, so in my last year of law school, I took a week off from school and I drove from Vancouver all the way to Dallas to go to the Texas State Fair, which is the fried food capital of the world. I ate every deep fried food at the Texas State Fair oh, in 24 wow. hours without vomiting and then drove home. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. So, so that's why for your birthday, we had everything fried at the office. Yeah, I love fried food. I, I didn't know you loved it that much. <laughs> Yes, I love it enough that I drove like a straight line down to the bottom of the continent, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, the, the U.S. But yeah, That's dedication. <laughs> yeah, I got a speeding ticket in Kansas, and uh, I did not fight that one. I I did register it in dispute, and then I paid it before my hearing date because I realized that it would be ridiculous to drive all the way to Kansas to fight a $100 speeding ticket, and it would cost me more than $100 in gas. Oh, wow. Of course. Of course. And and wait, was there points with that then? No, because it was from Kansas, so it didn't show up on my BC record or anything. And you would have, you wanted to you even thought of disputing that? <laughs> yes. Yes. Because I'm crazy. I'm the ridiculous driver of the week this week. Thanks a lot, Miriam. <laughs> <laughs> Crap. <laughs> I've been exposed. Ages ago. <laughs> uh, what about you? Have you ever had any tickets? Bear in mind, we're still recording. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Uh, I had one that was, I guess it was a registered owner one since it was, it went to the car. Like they didn't know I was driving. It was like a camera okay so it, it, it just yeah it, it was just a letter that was sent to my home but um I've never been pulled over you are responsible <laughs> <laughs> well and I also don't drive that much if I you know if I think about it like I commute to work right so um I don't I only drive on weekends if I have to go somewhere so the chance of me getting a ticket I feel like isn't that much that's something that our clients say a lot. They say, you know, I'm, I drive more, I drive for a living. So the chances of me getting a ticket are higher. And I always find that that's, you know, I mean, your, your logic is a little better because the chances of you getting a ticket are lower because you don't drive as much, but the chances of you getting a ticket don't increase because you drive more. They increase because you violate the law more. <laughs> that's true. That's true. But also I find that it's just, it's very specific sometimes. Like um, if I'm in a lane and I um, I cross the line a little bit, let's say I've noticed that even for that kind of thing, um, I could get pulled over for the tiniest little thing, right? So um, even though I'm not violating the law, like, you know, by like, you know, running someone over or doing like something very extreme or um, not even signaling, but I just, let's say, again, I hover over the, the line, right? So again, for little things like that, you could get pulled over, which, um, yeah, I, I find that I, the chances would be increased for me if I were to be driving all the time on the road. Yeah. Okay. All right. Makes any sense. Yeah, it does make sense. I see it your way now. See, you're much more compassionate. I'm usually like, well, but you, you, if you drove perfectly all the time, your chances of getting a ticket would be very low. But nobody drives perfectly all the time. Not all the time. And I think it's also the eye of the beholder too, right? Depends on the officer and how they see, you know, one officer might not ticket you for the same thing that another officer would. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's true.
Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. This was great. Yes, thank you for having me. And uh, well, I guess if people, usually when I have a guest on the podcast, I say, how can people reach you? But they can call our office to reach you because you're, you're working out of our office. Um, the lawyer who's your principal shares office space with us. So um, that makes it very easy. So if the, you need to reach Miriam or us, uh, you can give us a call at 604-685-8889 or find us online at vancouvercriminallaw.com and tune in next week for another exciting episode of Driving Law.